Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kevin Cruz. I teach uh, in the Department of History here and I'm here to lead a conversation with my colleague Julian Zelizer. Uh, spending time with us today to discuss his new book, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of the Speaker and the Rise of the Republican Party. Uh, Julian Zelizer is the Malcolm Stephenson Forbes Professor of History and Public Affairs. He's written endless books and op-eds and articles on political history. He probably has another book out this morning, uh, given the rate of productivity he has. He also has a weekly column on CNN, uh, the co-host of Princeton's Politics and Polls podcast, and is a contributor on uh, NPR's Here and Now. Uh, today's talk about the book will last uh, about an hour, and it'll include a Q&A. There's a Q&A button right here beneath me uh, in Zoom. Uh, and you can enter your questions there and uh, they'll be uh, uh, fed to me uh, through a private chat and I can, I can ask them to Julian uh, when the time comes. Feel free to put those questions in uh, whenever you would like. Uh, so thanks so much for uh, being with us here today, Julian, to talk about this great book. It's great to be here. It's great to be part of this. Now, um, everybody knows Newt Gingrich as the speaker. We're currently living in his post-speakership. Uh, but tell people about Newt Gingrich before he was Speaker Gingrich. Uh, where did Newt Gingrich uh, come from? What, what were his early experiences? What drove him on this path to politics? So Newt Gingrich is this guy. He's born uh, right near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to a working class family, didn't have uh, tons of money. Uh, he is raised, his, his father, his biological father, leaves his mom while uh, a few days after they're married while she's pregnant. Uh, she remarries and he spends a lot of his youth as an army brat. His uh, stepdad's in the military and they go to different places in Europe until they finally settle in Georgia uh, where he will have his uh, kind of base for the rest of his career. He's uh, always a very ambitious young guy. Uh, he has a sense of confidence about himself. He's pretty brash. Uh, at the same time, he's raised in a pretty tough atmosphere. I mean, his biological dad left. His stepfather is caring, but very cold with him, very into making sure he's macho enough. Uh, Gingrich is smart. He goes to Emory University as an undergraduate. He gets married at the same time to his high school math teacher who follows him uh, to college. And she gets a job uh, in the area. He then goes to Tulane and he gets his PhD in our discipline of history. Uh, and he gets his first job uh, in West Georgia College. This is a guy, he's a Rockefeller Republican. He loves Richard Nixon, uh, not for the Watergate stuff, but before that, the idea that Republicans could build this grand coalition. And he's not someone who's particularly taken by the 1960s counterculture. He doesn't really get it. Uh, what he likes is the politics. And he takes this job. He doesn't like academia. He has no interest in really publishing books. And he applies to be president of the college right after he gets there. He doesn't get why he can't be eligible. And he wants to move up. So he leaves and he decides to run. Uh, he leaves academia, basically. He decides to run for Congress in 1974 and uh, in Georgia for the House seat that's taken by Congressman Flint, who's an old school Southern Democrat, incumbent, been there for a while, takes him on, doesn't beat him. Flint is popular, still popular enough, and Watergate's dragging down the GOP. He runs again in 76, doesn't work, although he gets a lot closer to beating him. And then Flint retires in 1978, and here Gingrich, who by 78 has shifted to the right, He's allied himself with the conservative movement. He's met some of the activists and the National Party has tagged him as a potential up and comer. He wins an open seat and that's when his career in Washington starts. Now, once again, to Washington, you know, again, we think of Newt Gingrich as kind of the embodiment of Republican politics in the 90s, but he very much wasn't that way at the start. Talk about how Gingrich First, before he can challenge liberals or Democrats or anything, first he has to take on the kind of the existing structure in the Republican Party. What's his relationship with, with them during the early days of, of say the Reagan administration? Yeah, so he, so he comes in and, and for people listening, uh, 
Republicans had lost, they barely had controlled Congress since 1932. There was only two periods where they have control uh, of Congress before 1980 at all. Uh, uh, they win control in the 46 elections, lose it in 48. They win control in 52, lose it in 54. So since 1955, Democrats dominated Capitol Hill. Uh, and even after the 1980 election, when Republicans took control of the Senate, they didn't get control of the House. So many Republicans just basically had been in the minority their whole time there. They assumed that's how it was always going to be. Uh, they had achieved power by forming coalitions with Democrats. Uh, Midwestern Republicans worked with Southern Democrats, for example, to oppose uh, civil rights legislation, to block unions. Um, but they felt like a permanent minority. Uh, and they had gotten accustomed to the way Washington worked. They believed in the process. They believed that ultimately legislation and negotiation was part of what you did in Washington. And Gingrich had, he said, enough with that. Uh, and his promise when he came in was uh, that he would help Republicans retake control of Congress. And he argued that Democrats, his main argument, were corrupt. And so you had to do absolutely everything and anything to defeat them. And so some older Republicans, like uh, Bob Michael, who's the House Minority Leader from Illinois, a very good person, uh, liked very much on Capitol Hill, believed in working within the system, he and Gingrich were at loggerheads early on. Uh, Michael couldn't believe the kinds of things Gingrich was willing to do, the kind of smear he would throw out there, the political theater he engaged in uh, to essentially trick voters into thinking one thing was happening when it really wasn't. So they have a fraught relationship. And a lot of the senior Republicans feel that way. But part of what I write about in the book is over the course of the 80s, even Bob Michael gradually says, OK, Maybe there's something to what he's doing. And they start to learn to live with Gingrich politics and actually embrace it as a way that maybe they can achieve power one day. Excellent. And so, you know, Gingrich had some allies, right? So who, talk about the, 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 the kind of the, the Young Turks are with them, the Conservative Opportunity Society. What's that all about? Yeah, so uh, Gingrich, he doesn't like uh, committees and he doesn't really care about legislation, but he does understand organizing. And so he puts together a group of like-minded conservatives uh, that in 1983 and 84 become a presence on Capitol Hill. It's called the Conservative Opportunity Society. Uh, one example of a member is a guy named Robert Walker, uh, who was not a, a, a particularly well-known conservative, but he starts to make a name for himself by going on C-SPAN, a new channel at the time, all the time uh, and, and trying to make his presence known. Gingrich puts this caucus together uh, initially with about 12 and 13 Republicans and they're devoted to causing problems. They're basically hell raisers and they're devoted to making a lot of noise uh, in part to help Ronald Reagan who instantly sees their value but also just to shake up Washington, to shake up the Republican leadership <laughs> and to launch pretty blistering attacks on uh, Democrats. And the Conservative Opportunity Society, which is not initially embraced by the leadership of the party, uses television as their main uh, outlet to communicate to the public. Let's talk about that, because I wanted to talk about one of the things that Gingrich is really good at. He doesn't like committee work. He's good at organization. He's great at the media. Uh, so how does Gingrich uh, take advantage of, of the media in the, in, in the 80s uh, to kind of to, to, to get his message out, but also to kind of shape the political dynamic a little more favorably to him? So he does. I, I found when I was writing this book, lots of stuff that he did, uh, even more than I suspected at the beginning. One thing is he instantly becomes a go-to person for the Washington press corps. He will speak to any reporter at any time. Uh, and it's known he's always going to be available. And I found a lot of memos from his staff saying by 1981 and 82, reporters basically would, you know, use him as a first source or first quote uh, because he was open to that. So he ingratiates himself actually to the Washington press corps and he communicates with the press all the time. I mean, the book we'll talk about revolves around Jim Wright and his effort to bring down this Speaker of the House, Jim Wright. 
But one of the ways he does it, he's always sending stuff to reporters and he's always schmoozing with them, telling them, oh, you have to look into this scandal and uh, look into these reports. So, so one thing is he establishes himself as a, a person in the established Washington press corps. Uh, a second thing he does, which I didn't know about, is he goes on conservative, uh, or he goes on a talk radio show in Washington all the time. There's a radio show that's the uh, model that becomes crossfire on CNN, a conservative and a liberal. And the conservative host has to take off, um, and I'm forgetting his name right now, he takes off for a little while for an illness. So Gingrich volunteers to do it for free. And he goes on this show a lot, he's a co-host, and he does it so that in Washington, uh, politicians and staffers will hear him all the time on air. And he sees instantly how radio can be very powerful as a medium. And finally, the story you're probably alluding to uh, is how he uses C-SPAN. C-SPAN's a new channel. Uh, the House had only allowed cameras to cover their floor in, 19, uh, in 1978 as part of the reforms of the post-Watergate period. In 1979, uh, uh, C-SPAN is formed. It's a new cable channel. Cable, uh, for everyone out there who doesn't remember, is just becoming uh, a thing for most American households in the early 1980s. And so in 1983 and 84, the Conservative Opportunity Society, led by Gingrich, they start to go to the floor uh, every day and make speeches at the end of the day about different issues because anyone's allowed to speak. Uh, and what Gingrich understands is now you have a cable network covering the person speaking. So it's great, it's free publicity, a couple hundred thousand people are watching all the time. In 1984, in the spring, they start to accelerate their attacks and they start to focus on the idea Democrats are weak on defense and they'll go at the end of the day and make really blistering speeches, using language that was not considered the conventional language to talk about this, ripping apart the Democrats for not supporting Ronald Reagan. And the speeches get worse and worse. Uh, and finally, they're just attacking individual Democrats by name and asking them to respond to the charges that they're essentially unpatriotic. And if you're watching on C-SPAN, it looks like the Democrats have no response. You're watching the speaker, they're attacking and no one says anything. But what you couldn't see was at the end of the day, no one was there. And the camera only pointed at the speaker so you couldn't see the empty chamber. So this all blows up. Uh, the speaker at the time, Tip O'Neill, orders the cameras to pan the chamber to show this is big theater. Uh, Tip O'Neill at one point goes down from the speaker's seat uh, in the middle of the proceedings and attacks Gingrich saying it's the lowest thing he's seen in his entire career in politics. It's like McCarthyism and it all blows up, but Gingrich kind of wins in the end because what happens by the end is all the networks cover this. Uh, they're covering Newt Gingrich, they're covering what's called cam scam and Gingrich A gets his message out. The Democrats are these weak on defense, unpatriotic politicians who don't care about our safety. And more important, he's the focus of coverage. So this guy who's only been in office for a few years, doesn't do any committee work, who's kind of seen as a McCarthyite political bomb thrower, he's the focus of attention. And that's really what he wanted all along. And so he achieves his goal in the middle of a conflict that gives television and gives reporters in print exactly what they crave, conflict, controversy, uh, and scandal. Now, now so you, as you know, this is Tip O'Neill's Congress, right? And he was very much a different kind of politician, different kind of speaker. Does he learn anything from the from Gingrich and, the, and Cam Scam? Does, does he change his approach to media himself? Does Gingrich or, no, does, or does, does, does O'Neill? Does O'Neill? Oh yeah, O'Neill. O'Neill does. O'Neill's a really interesting speaker. Uh, some people who remember O'Neill might remember him from when he appeared on the television show Cheers, uh, which wasn't usually what speakers or politicians did. He he. This the show, uh, our age remembers it well. Um, uh, about a bar in Boston uh, where everyone knows your name and where the cast was there all the time. It seemed like. Um, but there's one episode where all of a sudden Tip O'Neill pops in and it was actually significant. I think it was in 1984 because Tip O'Neill is someone who's starting to become cognizant that you can't avoid 
uh, television. You can't avoid reporters, which he did actually before. He used to refuse invitations to be on the Sunday morning talk shows, which today seems inconceivable. He wanted to go to his beach house uh, and take the weekend off. But gradually he learns, and in part he learns because of Gingrich, you can't do this. Uh, so he becomes much more media focused, but he retires in 1986. Uh, so he's really doing it at the end point of his uh, speakership. Okay. And so, and so after O'Neill and before Gingrich, we get, um, uh, we get Jim Wright. Uh, and Jim Wright is not as well known as either O'Neill or, or, or Gingrich after him. Uh, tell people about uh, who Jim Wright was, uh, what this, uh, what this uh, Texas Democrat was all about. So Jim Wright, he's known in Washington. He's not known out of Washington. Uh, he's a Texas Democrat, very old school. He loves legislating. He loves doing stuff for his district. He's, if, you, if he walked down the streets of his district in Texas, everyone knew him uh, in places like Fort Worth. Everyone not just knew him, but they felt there was a connection. He had done something to help them at some point. Uh, he wasn't particularly liked in Washington. He wasn't a warm and cuddly person. He was known to have a, a very fierce temper. Uh, reporters didn't love him because he wouldn't meet with them. And when he met with them, they couldn't even take notes. He didn't trust the media. And he was someone who came into Washington in the 50s and 60s. And while he understood Watergate was wrong, he wasn't a post-Watergate Democrat. He was a Lyndon Johnson kind of Democrat. And he was the majority leader for the Democrats in the House from 1976 to 1986, when he becomes a very loyal partisan. He's very good at uh, keeping Democrats on uh, one page, and he's pretty tough with Republicans. There's a series of incidents I cover where Republicans are angry because he's ruling with a heavy hand and he's trying to contain people like Gingrich. Um, and he becomes speaker, and he's a person where the media had like to cover him in Texas and nationally and raise questions about different parts of his career. Uh, so for example, he published a short book of speeches and little writings um, called Reflections of a Public Man. And he would sell them in bulk whenever he spoke to a group, whether at a college, a trade association. Uh, and he did that because the ethics rules in Congress said you can only earn so much money in speaking on our area but you could earn all you want selling books. So he and other Democrats and Republicans sold lots of books. He had gone into business, um, uh, investment business with someone in his district uh, who was a real estate developer. And this was legal. It followed the ethics rules. You could do this at the time, but there were stories like, well, what does this person in Fort Worth want of the speaker? So there were stories like this about him that led a lot of the media to not, not like him, but keep raising questions about, is he really the right Democrat for the post Watergate period to be Speaker of the House? He wasn't someone who thought about how did things look? And he wasn't someone who understood how the new media was really taking form, cable, investigative journalism. He didn't get all that. Um, and he was a legislator's legislator. So that's who, ends up clashing with Newt Gingrich, who within about a day sees this is a perfect target for me. Okay. You mentioned that he doesn't get the new media. I want to pause there for a second and come back to that, because that is a really fascinating thing, is that it's not just Congress is changing and politics are changing. The media landscape is, is, is being rad radically changed in this period. C-SPAN, as you know, in the late 70s is a new arrival, but, uh, you know, and no offense to C-SPAN, not the biggest player in the room. What's going on with network news, talk radio, cable news here? How does that change? Because your interest in the media is, is, is kind of a through line in your work. How is the, the media transformation impacting the political one and, and vice versa? It's changing in a lot of ways. I think part of the change is being driven by television, that uh, this is now a media of television, a news media where TV is supplanting the newspapers as the driver, a lot of the conversation. And in the era of cable, you have networks that are producing news entirely. So their business is news, as opposed to in the 70s or 60s, when you had networks like CBS that had a news show. Now you had a network like CNN, 
uh, and then Fox that's, that's post this, that, that's just doing news. So the incentives are kind of changing. Um, and you also have changes in the print business. They're facing pressure already in the 1980s. How are they gonna keep up with television? So all of this means one factor happening in this story is the press is looking for sensation. They're looking for controversy. They're basically looking for stories through which they can cover Washington in ways that will be appealing and attract viewers and readers. They're also shaped by the post Watergate kind of world of journalism where Woodward and Bernstein were seen uh, as heroes and investigative journalism had become an important part of the profession. And so you have a whole generation that in this new context is seeking to uncover corruption and to try to find out what politicians do wrong and they wanna catch the next Watergate. So you bring together investigative journalism and you bring a more commercially oriented television focused kind of journalism and it's a pretty explosive environment in which these politicians are operating. You also finally have just younger journalists who are coming into the business in the uh, late 70s and 80s who are very disconnected from the world of politics that was starting to fall apart. So. There's reporters who see someone like Wright and they don't know much about, is he doing anything wrong? But there's just something wrong and they put that into their writing. And so that's kind of the media world of the moment. Okay. Well, the actual scandal over Wright and, and Gingrich's takedown, I don't need you to kind of recount event by, by event, but what about that would, would people watching this be surprised at who think they understand how politics works today? Was there something about the scandal that um, would seem unusual to our ears today or, 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 or out of the normal? I'd probably feel more familiar. I mean, meaning, uh, other than the fact that the heart of the scandal were issues that today seem pretty innocuous uh, mm -hmm. compared to what we see on a daily basis coming out of Washington. Um, I think what was so interesting to the story was how little Gingrich needed to whip up a scandal and a scandal frenzy that uh, Speaker Wright was the most corrupt speaker in American history. He took little stories that today, like the book sales, they don't seem right, but they don't seem like the biggest deal in the world or that abnormal, uh, and, and, and created a portrait of a, almost a criminal in the Speaker's seat. Uh, and, and Gingrich understood that you didn't need that much to shape a narrative like that. And that if you fed the media a lot of accusations, some of which were totally false, there were ways to get that in there as long as you were willing to go there, uh, which was Gingrich's great political asset, not unlike the president. He's always willing to go wherever he needs to go. He doesn't mm -hmm. care about guardrails, restraints, uh, or any kind of norm. So the surprise when you look back some people might remember this speaker was forced to resign, first one in American history at the time, but just how little was at the heart of the story. There wasn't anything that large. And I think that's ultimately what led many Democrats and Jim Wright to be so frustrated. Uh, when Wright resigns, he says, I wasn't always perfect and I did things which were wrong, but this is ludicrous that I should step down from my position because of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that in retrospect is what's most surprising. It's also surprising how quickly Washington got caught up in the story that uh, Gingrich was trying to tell. And Gingrich is interesting. He is guilty of all sorts of things that he accuses others of being guilty of. He's literally guilty of his own, or being investigated at the time, of his own violation uh, of ethics for a book sale as he's accusing the speaker of doing the same. Uh, and so you, you really kind of step back and, and have to wonder why did his attacks stick so well and why was he able to generate an ethics committee investigation when he himself is such a flawed character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the great quotes that comes out of uh, uh, the, the, the Brooks affair is uh, that line about mindless cannibalism. Uh, but that that the, the the Congress was entering a new era of intense hyperpartisanship, intense personal attacks, uh, what we later call the politics of personal destruction. Uh, is this something new? Uh, and and either way, what happens once this precedent is set? How does this then impact not just Wright's downfall, but but what rises in its place? So 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 let me give you a long answer. 
uh, but not long-winded, hopefully. I mean, the, the first part of the argument is obviously there's people like Gingrich throughout American political history, and there's people who uh, ignore any uh, ideas that you have to have concerns beyond politics and political power. But what's really interesting is this Joe McCarthy kind of figure in this period I'm studying, he becomes part of the leadership and ultimately will become Speaker of the House. So it's not simply that there's malicious, toxic politics. It's that the Republican Party by the end of the 80s is embracing this as what the party is about. That's the switch that I think makes this so, so notable and helps uh, lead us to where we are today. It's a partisanship all the time and uh, a do anything kind of partisanship that for the leadership of a party to embrace can be pretty devastating. The mindless cannibalism, uh, it comes uh, from Jim Wright's resignation speech, uh, which is a key story. He gives a one hour speech and he basically goes through every accusation and he says, I'm not guilty of it. And he explains why, and he says why this is not right. Uh, and he admits in that speech, he's not perfect and there's things he wishes he could do again. But then he says, I'm gonna give up my position. I'm gonna give up my seat so that there isn't a period of mindless cannibals, a meeting where the parties eat themselves uh, into a point of oblivion and the whole institution is dysfunctional. And um, it's a really great speech on its own terms, but it captures the difference of where the parties were. I think a lot of Democrats believed in some ways what Jim Wright was saying, that you could stop this, that you could put a check on it. Gingrich is sitting listening to the speech and has no intention of stopping. Uh, almost as soon as Wright has stepped down, he releases the names of like 10 or 11 more legislators who he's gonna go after and it never ends through uh, this day. So there's an imbalance in, in kind of how the parties were operating at the time. And I do think we've gone uh, into certainly a period of mindless cannibalism. We're living through the consequences when we watch uh, our nation's policies uh, toward the pandemic. But I also argue that the mindless cannibalism uh, can be a little um, uh, a kind of false argument in that the story of my book is one party was moving in that direction where I think the Democrats remain much more ambivalent about that kind of partisanship and much more divided as a party over policy, over tactics. Uh, and so uh, the period since 1989 has to be, I think, examined that way with, with two very different parties and how they approach the partisan mm -hmm. wars. Mm -hmm. Well, as you noted, you know, Gingrich himself uh, was certainly not innocent of, of ethical problems uh, and, and had in fact done some of the things Wright uh, was, was, was being charged with by Gingrich. How does the mindless cannibalism turn out for Newt Gingrich and his allies? Right. So it doesn't turn out well. I mean, ultimately, Gingrich, who will become speaker in 94, will resign as speaker in 98. He is someone... Uh, who is just, he, he lives a life, it's very interesting to see him attacking others, like I said, for things he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, ethics is a constant problem for him. Uh, he becomes speaker in 94. In 1997, he becomes the first speaker to be fined for ethics violations, which is quite a story given how he comes to power. His personal life is just always uh, a mess. He had multiple uh, affairs. He famously talked about uh, divorce uh, with his first wife while she was in the hospital for cancer surgery, um, you know, uh, and then his second wife, uh, also the marriage broke up and he's currently married, uh, you know, to uh, someone who is part of the Trump administration uh, representing the nation in the Vatican. So he's been allied with the moral majority, even though he lives a life that is anything but, I think in most people's eyes, uh, that would be agreed upon. Uh, so in 97, he has his ethics violations. Then in 98, uh, while Republicans are moving to uh, impeach President Clinton for a scandal that uh, grew out of his affair with an intern, Monica Lewinsky, uh, Gingrich will be brought down from power. Uh, in the middle of the debate, the Republicans don't do so well in the November midterm elections. And so House Republicans are angry with them and they're willing to let him go. And they're also angry that he's having an affair while the Republicans, a pretty well-known affair, while Republicans are going after the president for the same. So 
They force him to step down in 98, which he does. And it's a Shakespearean ending. I mean, both because of his own personal issues and how that ultimately uh, overwhelms his ability to maintain power, but it's also fitting. I mean, he introduced a model of politics where people can be taken down quickly, uh, where power is transitory. And so uh, it's not so surprising that he would be one of the first victims of that mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're coming uh, uh, close up to opening up to questions from other people. And again, we've got a couple in the queue. If you, ha if you have a question, now's the time to, to type it in uh, in the Q&A box uh, right underneath here. Um, and they'll, uh, they'll get it to me and I'll read it out. Uh, this is always a, a standard question we, we, we do when we get these, but, but I got to ask, what surprised you the most when you were researching this? What, what really jumped out at you? You, you noted Gingrich doing, uh, doing the radio program. That's a great one. Anything else? Yeah, one is when you go in the archives and I started doing the early career, his early runs uh, for the House, how deliberate he was about mapping out a strategy where the focus really would be on corruption and uh, presenting Republicans as this anti-establishment force in American politics. And he just keeps perfecting that argument and refining that argument uh, over time. And when you see that, you often think politicians, including someone like him, just do what the moment calls for, what's on their mind. But this is something he had thought through from the beginning. So that was one surprise for me. A second was how a lot of very good investigative journalists just didn't see how their reporting was going to be used uh, as a partisan weapon. They, didn't, they were just trying to cover the relationship between money and politics, and all of a sudden, he would just seize these little stories and put them together with conclusions uh, and, and in a bigger picture. And it was really interesting to learn about how the media didn't understand how that was gonna happen and didn't mm -hmm. see it. Where today it's kind of obvious um, how that is gonna work. And finally, the surprise was how bad Speaker Wright was at responding to any of this. I mean, it was pretty stunning that as this scandal is brewing uh, and uh, as uh, he needs to respond to charges and the House Ethics Committee starts an investigation, he offers these really lengthy technical answers to every question. That's how he'll give the media an answer, where Gingrich is just saying, most corrupt speaker, most corrupt speaker. And, and Wright doesn't understand why this isn't going to work, and his lawyers don't get why it's going to work. And any political battle, when you look back and you see one side is just totally blowing it uh, all the time, it was kind of surprising and you understand the outcome. I'd say the one other surprise that readers of the book will see is there's a huge scandal revealed right toward the end of the process where the Ethics Committee releases a report on the questions we discussed and then the Washington Post uh, breaks a terrible story that one of the senior staffers for Wright one of his most trusted advisors, when he was younger, uh, he had brutally assaulted a woman, uh, almost killed her for no reason. It was just a kind of random attack of madness. And he'd gone to jail and he got out early because he got uh, a job in Wright's office. Uh, and there was a family connection. His name was John Mack. And this story was unbelievable. It had nothing to do with the ethics issues. And you know, Wright claimed he knew about his background. He thought it was a rehabilitative uh, program, which it was, but he didn't understand the severity of what this guy had done. And I don't know, when I read this whole story, it's a, key, it's a whole section of the book. It's just, uh, it's uh, both shocking and just yeah. stunning. Ultimately, that became pretty powerful as Democrats said, enough, we don't know what else is around the corner. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got some great questions here. And, and you, you were just talking about Gingrich's relationship with the media. A question here, is there anything the mainstream media can do in terms of how they cover politics to make it less likely that these kind of tactics from the right are successful electorally? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, this is something that gets a lot of discussion in the Trump era, for sure. There's a connection with what Gingrich did and does and what uh, President Trump does and there's this ongoing debate, how do journalists cover this? And how do they uh, get through these tactics without just appearing and being 
partisan reporters, uh, which, which in the end isn't healthy uh, either. I'm not a reporter, I'm an opinion person, um, but I do think there's room to focus on, on, on the facts and, and the truth. And for a reporter not being biased, but to cut through um, kind of the storm of disinformation that comes from politicians, I think that's part of the role of what they're doing. The whole mentality that you listen, write, or speak, and everyone else can settle it after that is a broken model. Uh, because if what you're reporting on is just, it's just falsehood, there needs to be another obligation professionally to what you're doing. So I think reporters have it in them. Some are doing it, uh, not just to fact check, but to write about stories in a way where a reader can understand really what's going on, what isn't going on, and evaluate themselves and allow their readers to evaluate or viewers um, kind of uh, how politicians are acting at a moment like this. I think in the end, that's, that's really the only way. Uh, and then there's the kind of boardrooms and uh, heads of every network and newspaper online to do some of the heavy lifting of thinking about who you put on or how are headlines written uh, so that you give honest journalism, but not mm -hmm. actually just replicate biased political journalism. And that's not just the reporters. That's a whole other step from editors to producers that I think needs a lot of work. So those are uh, two areas where it's going to have to be done. I don't know what to do about the world of the social media from uh, the medium uh, you and I are on Twitter to Facebook and all of them. It's just the, the challenge is it's filterless. I mean, anyone can say anything. And when they say anything, that could reach lots of people. And uh, there's even fewer controls there. And, and I, I think it's an issue and we're watching it in this election. And I think all three of those do need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, well, here's another good one. In undergrad political science courses, we're told that Gingrich is significant because he nationalized congressional elections. Um, would you argue that the weaponization of inflated scandals like Wright, impeachment, Benghazi, Fast and Furious, is Gingrich's more enduring legacy? I do. I mean, the, the national, I wonder what course that was. Uh, I hope it was a good one. The nationalization of midterms is something that in 94, uh, it's very deliberate. The contract with America is really a way to try to do that, to show a united Republican front and kind of reverse the claim of Tip O'Neill that all politics is local and, and really say it's, it's all national. And that is an important consequence. But I think the weaponization of the media, the weaponization of ethics rules, and the kind of notion that ultimately every part of the political process is expendable. Uh, in partisan warfare really is a legacy of his. And I'm not a historian who all the time writes about individuals changing the world kind of history, but I think there is a case to be made that this is one of the significant players in the post 1970s period. And, and I think uh, not only does he weaponize all this, not only does he uh, legitimate a, a partisanship above anything else model, where governance and where institutions just don't matter anymore. Even rhetorically, he uh, introduces and, and, and promotes uh, a, an idea that you can say anything, whether it's true, whether it's just uh, horribly unfair and, and ugly to your opponent. Uh, the Gingrich world of rhetoric is the world we live in today. And I think that's a big consequence. You need people to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, as we see today. And in the 80s and then 90s, he went there. And once you do that, others follow. There's a generation of Republicans uh, today. There's, some of them are still in office. Some of them are in the media, like Rick Santorum, for example, and even Mitch McConnell to some extent that I think are really influenced by what Gingrich did in those years. Mm -hmm. uh, great question. Here. Given the divisive nature of Gingrich's speakership, how did he get legislation passed? Uh, and as you noted before, that wasn't really his priority before he got the speakership. Uh, so what does, what's the purpose of being speaker for Newt Gingrich and what does he do with that job? Yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, he isn't, uh, even as speaker, focused entirely on uh, legislating much of the contract with America, which is a series of promises 
that he and the Republicans make. Uh, I think almost none of it actually get through the House and Senate. He gets a lot of it through the House, but it never has a chance in the Senate, things like term limits uh, on members. So there's not a huge record to come out of the contract with America. He doesn't have a huge burst of legislation. I mean, part of the issue is it's divided government and, uh, and he, he has to contend with a Democratic president. Uh, but, but ultimately, I'd say the biggest legislative accomplishment will be uh, kind of deficit reduction measures, uh, cuts in spending, for example, that he is starting to work on as a way to bridge what the GOP wants and what Gingrich wants. Famously, in 96, uh, the federal government ends its commitment to welfare as part of the budget package. And I'd say that's his most lasting legislative achievement from those years, but it's not grand. This is not like a period of, of huge legislation. It's more shift in the tenor of Washington. He's most famous not for legislation, but for the government shutdowns in 1995 and 96, where Washington came to a halt uh, and where uh, at that time, Americans lived through something that was considered shocking, uh, the, the breakdown of government. Today, it's pretty normal um, for that to happen. And then finally, the impeachment, which is the, the final piece, which is kind of the, it's the sequel to bringing down Speaker Wright. The, the next target was President Clinton. And it's a more than legislation. That's what we're gonna remember him by, uh, leading Republicans into that battle. Is, is Clinton impeached? without Speaker Gingrich? Does it happen with, say, another kind of Republican in there? I don't think so. And, and Gingrich was ambivalent about doing it. I mean, we, we've learned he wasn't totally on board with this and he understood the risk, but he introduces the atmosphere where they could go there. I mean, the Gingrich impeachment is uh, preceded by lots of investigations uh, in 1995 and 96 and an atmosphere where the Republicans are going after him, regardless of what he did. They, they were looking for stuff and they wanted to tie up his administration. And they were working with conservative talk radio to launch really blistering attacks on who he was, you know, even uh, radio shows calling him a murderer, Bill Clinton, because uh, uh, following the suicide of, of one of his top advisors, really kind of ugly stuff. Um, and I think uh, Gingrich fostered an atmosphere like that. I mean, that was the point of partisanship. You blew everything up mm -hmm. uh, and that's how you could bring your opponent down and you went after opponents with the idea not to uh, reach ultimately some point of agreement, but to devastate and destroy. And that's how Gingrich thinks and that's how he thought as speaker. All of that is why we ended up with that particular impeachment. And so, yeah, he's, uh, I'm not sure we would have had it without him. He was, look, Republicans loved him in 95, meaning he delivered what he promised. When he came into Washington in 1979, he said, I'll bring you um, a Republican majority. And many Republicans said, that's never gonna happen. In 1989, while he's bringing right down, House Republicans elect him to be House Minority Whip, which is a leadership position. And even Republicans like Olympia Snow did that because they said, well, maybe he'll bring us the majority. 94, he brought them a majority. It seemed impossible. So in 95 and 96, they were listening to the Gingrich way. And that's why the party moved in this direction. Um, Another question about uh, uh, kind of the legacy here. In addition to the things you've discussed, it's my sense that one of Gingrich's most lasting legacies is his intentional devaluation of House procedures and committee processes and structures, seniority system, term limits, et cetera, which grounded the legislative process. This created a vacuum in the Republican House caucus of expertise and a willingness to do business across the aisle that was filled by demagogues, ideologues, and Tea Partiers, thus the House Republican Caucus of today. Would you please comment on this? So do you see um, uh, Gingrich uh, intentionally devaluing old House procedures, um, not just the committee process, but general comedy, and what happened as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, all of the above were things he abandoned. And 
There are the norms of Washington, which we shouldn't look at nostalgically, uh, but certainly there, there was a norm in the period from the 1930s to 70s that you were working in an institution and ultimately at some level it had to be workable and, and that checked what you did and what you said and how far you would go uh, in general. And, and he definitely abandons that. It's not what you do. And I talk about a memo he sent out to Republicans in 1990 saying, call Democrats sick, traitorous, uh, radical, use the worst language because that's how you're going to win uh, election. But he does that with, nor with processes too. I mean, my book is how he uses these Watergate ethics processes that post Watergate ethics rules that are put into place to make uh, Congress a little bit better, to have some accountability. But he sees them and he says, nah, that's just something we're gonna weaponize and we're gonna ultimately, even if it destroys the idea ethics can be usable, we're gonna use it to bring down the Democrats. And he also talks by the 80s about using things like the budget and raising the debt ceiling as partisan weapons. He says, you need to create crises sometimes or a sense of crisis to move things. And so a lot of the tactics that you have seen uh, from the Tea Party slash Freedom Caucus, uh, such as threatening not to raise the debt ceiling and send our whole country into default or uh, embracing and using the birther rhetoric during Obama's presidency. And obviously today, uh, President Trump and the kind of politics he employs or Senator McConnell uh, and his refusal to uh, allow a Supreme Court confirmation in 2016. But today, you know, he's basically willing to do it even if members of the committee are ill with COVID, you know, he's, he's moving forward. That all is the kind of strategy Gingrich argued was pretty important. Processes can be used for whatever a party needs them to be used for uh, without any limitations. So that's um, a great answer on Gingrich's uh, impact on, on Congress and the, the, the political world of the House at large. What about outside that? I've got a question here. Is there a connection between Gingrich and, say, Roger Stone or Steve Bannon? Uh, were they their own entities or did you mentor them in some way or inspire them in some way? So there's a connection, one connection that's in my book. Uh, he knew Stone in the 80s and uh, Lee Atwater. Is, it's not in the question. He was another of this little cabal. Uh, and Outwater, who's from South Carolina, a pretty notorious campaign consultant, also a do anything kind of um, political tactician, plays on racial backlash, uh, totally distorts information. He runs George H.W. Bush's 1988 campaign, and uh, he actually brings in the Jim Wright story into the campaign early on, before anyone thought this was a legitimate thing to do. Uh, as a way to attack the Democrats and, and for George H.W. Bush to paint the Democrats as corrupt when he was being accused of, of sleaze because of the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, so Atwater is one person early on. Roger Stone very much knows Gingrich and what he sees in Gingrich isn't new, meaning this is what Stone loves to do, but he sees an elected official in a leadership position by 89 who's willing to do the kinds of stuff he likes to do. And that was, you know, I think very important. Bannon's personal relationship with Gingrich, I don't know, although they do come together in the 2016 election. Um, I start my book when Gingrich is one of the three finalists to be vice president. Uh, it was Pence, Chris Christie, our former governor, uh, and, and Gingrich. And uh, the team, uh, including Paul Manafort also, another name from, uh, from our moment, uh, they like Gingrich a lot, uh, and they understand their kind of kindred spirits, Donald Trump and him, and they end up going with Pence, obviously. Um, but the worlds connect. Kellyanne Conway, she ran Gingrich's 2012 campaign when he ran the campaign, also as a conservative populist. Uh, and Bannon's arguments are very Gingrich-like, meaning he understands and talks all about um, the politics of chaos and uh, the power to shape how the nation is speaking about issues. I have a quote in my book from a few years ago where uh, Bannon told Michael Moore, the movie maker, that uh, Republicans come for the head wound and Democrats come for a pillow fight. 
And I think that's very much how Gingrich sees the world. So yes, they're, they're all part of a universe. And I think Gingrich's influence looms large because unlike any of them, he was uh, the leader of the party. Mm -hmm. So what happened after Gingrich? Uh, I've got a question here. When, when uh, Dennis Haster became speaker after Gingrich, what changes from Gingrich's speakership were successfully and immediately reversed, if any? Or, or did, did Haster uh, uh, continue on that path? Yeah, he was just quiet, uh, but he didn't really undo what Gingrich had done. I mean, uh, Gingrich, all the things we're talking about, which he then introduces as speaker, are very much in place. Gingrich reorganizes uh, how the um, Republican Party works in terms of making it a top-down uh, party very much on Capitol Hill, where every committee leader was put into place only if they were totally loyal to the speaker. Seniority became much less important, and most decisions came from the center. And during uh, Hastert's time as speaker, he's not as visible. He'll become more visible later uh, because of his criminal activity. But at the time, he was seen as an antidote to Gingrich. But the party doesn't change. It keeps moving in that rightward uh, direction. And even George W. Bush, uh, with, on a lot of issues, finds a Republican Party that is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, for example, Bush is a very big supporter of a liberalized immigration policy, and he tries to push kind of grand compromise that by today's terms would be impossible with a path to citizenship for over 10 million undocumented workers. But the House Republicans have not going for it. Uh, and they stifle the whole thing. And so he's already seen that even in that period, the Republicans are very much the Gingrich era Republicans. And I don't think Haster changes it at all. And then obviously, uh, his whole downfall and the horrendous scandal that what he was involved with just amplified this uh, idea that the party doesn't really care about a lot of the values arguments they're arguing for. It's really about uh, pursuing partisanship. Excellent. Uh, we've got time really for one more last question, but it's one that's come up a couple times in the Q&A, so I think it's the, it's the big one. Uh, various people are asking a, a version of, why don't the Democrats do this? Do the Democrats do this? Will the Democrats ever do this? So, so is the Gingrich model something that Democrats have picked up, will pick up, uh, are about to pick up? So I, I think the difference between the parties that I saw back in 1989 is still with us today. Um, I think, uh, I do believe the parties are very different. That's not to say Democrats can't be incredibly partisan. Uh, and that some Democrats could be underhanded. That's definitely true. Um, but the parties as a whole are different. I think uh, Republicans both move much more rightward as a whole, and they're just willing to use tactics that I think as a whole Democrats are not in that place. You can see that in the campaign now, just given who the uh, leads are uh, and the candidates are, they're very different. Democrats ended up with Biden, who believes in normalcy, who believes in the process. I'm not sure Democrats can ever go there. I mean, I've been asked this question so many times with this book. It's interesting to see what's on readers' minds. Uh, I think Democrats are a party that remains committed to using government, uh, and Republicans are not in principle. They're two core principles that are very different. And so if you are a party that's not particularly committed to government and your rhetoric is about the market, uh, you're going to be more comfortable doing things that will be destructive to the ability of government to work, to governance as a process. Whereas if you are the Democrats, you can't go so far. You can't be the party that is also willing to blow everything up because then you lose what is at the very heart of your agenda, whether you're a centrist or a progressive. At some level, they're all turning to government as a key part of what the party is going to fight for. So I think they're always going to be uh, more checked. And at least in 2020, the Democrats remain uh, at the elected level, for sure, much more fragmented and diverse. You can see how the splits between the progressives and the class of 2018 keep playing out on different issues, where Republicans are much more unified. They don't have these problems. So again, there too, 
the mechanisms that allow you to reach compromise within the Democratic Party are important, not just for government to work, but for their party to work. Whereas Republicans, they are on the same page, they are moving in the same direction, and they're fine to do things that ultimately are going to burn down the House. Well, way, way to land on the title and the, the end of the last question. Beautifully done. Again, the book is Burning Down the House, as Julian just uh, promoted. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this concludes uh, today's events. Take care, Julian. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kevin.